you know, uh, nutritional support program as well as antifungal, and she just does, can, she doesn't get sick, even though you think she should. How about Liz, as a multiple cancers patient, pelvic cancer in 2001, lung cancer in 2003, she had massive recalcitrant edema, I mean big edema on her legs. We tried every which way but loose to deal with. Guess what started making it better? The treatment for antifungal and antiparasite. Her platelets are still over 500,000. Her lymphocytes are less than 800. And here's the problem. I can get lots of these patients clinically better. Budging their blood tests is hard. That's an interesting thing. That means there's some piece of the puzzle I don't quite yet understand. Changes in the composition of these biofilms are associated with oral diseases, dental caries, cavities, periodontitis, and there are many varied interactions by all these species. So there's no one simple, oh, tell me what I need to do. What you need to do is to treat individual patients as individual patients, just like you do with regard to their dental needs for their teeth. Okay, they are all different and they will all respond differently and that's an important understanding. Pathogenic species are the periodontal microbiota. Now, I'm real strong on this. You know, we have different microbiomes, but I think the one in the mouth is the one that starts getting us in trouble. And then the one in the gut just joins in after we give antibiotics and screw everything up. And moving the microbiomes around is tough. It is not easy. It takes time. The oral microbiota represent an important part of the human microbiota, and they include several thousand, hundreds to thousands of species. So, you know, we're just scratching the surface and understanding this. But the gold standard is preventing caries and gingivitis and periodontitis, periodontitis, and that's removing that biofilm. That's why brushing and flossing are important. The most recent classification of periodontal diseases acknowledges the clinical expression of plaque-induced gingival inflammation, substantially modified by systemic factors. In other words, anti-inflammation approaches, vitamin C, nutritional support. Metabolic, environmental, and systemic factors have a direct impact on the pathway of plaque-induced gingivitis. In other words, telling your patients to eat right is important as a stratagem. Invasive fungal infections are a significant health problem in immunocompromised patients, but what we've learned today with Dr. Levy aren't most of our patients, most of us, immunocompromised if we have low levels of vitamin C. Aren't we flirting with scurvy? Because it turns out, you know, that the, the lining in the endothelium, the, the blood vessels, is repaired when it's damaged by vitamin C. And so when it's not repaired, that's scurvy inside the blood vessels. So we are, in that sense, immunocompromised. Fungal infection is difficult to treat because antifungal therapy is still controversial. That's by the doctors who don't understand it. It's still based on clinical grounds. Yes, it's called getting the patient better. Drug dose and treatment outcome, those are difficult issues. All right, the incidence of fungal infections is considered a serious public health issue worldwide but not necessarily here. So take a lead from us? No, I think not. Fungal resistance is a real serious issue, and we're struggling with that. In our part of the world, this is in Denmark, invasive fungal infections include invasive yeast infections with Canada. That's the most common, simple yeast, okay? And that is the dominating pathogen literally around the world. Aspergillus, there's mold and yeast and barrier leakage and immune function and the... Uh, Basically, you start getting sick with fungus or mold or yeast or mildew, people can, then you actually are on your way out. We just haven't found the disease process that's going to take you. Molds are ubiquitous in nature and the environment, and we inhale their spores constantly. So invasive mold infections typically come from the airways. And you know what the problem is? They don't just stay in the lungs. They can disseminate through the bloodstream. There are remarkable differences in virulence according to the different candida species, yeast species. But you know what? <laughs> it's kind of like you want to get dead from a 50 millimeter howitzer or a 22. Kind of doesn't matter if you're still dead. Okay. So don't worry about how pathogenic a particular organism. Worry about what kind of result it is having for you. Now, recently there's a correlation between fungal infection and MS in the peripheral blood of patients. And you know what? It's also in the cerebrospinal fluid. 
which would suggest maybe that's the more aggressive forms of MS. Antibodies reacting against several candida yeast species being found in these patients in the CSF. Wow, maybe all these illnesses really are fungal. Overall, these findings support the notion that fungal infection can be demonstrated and may constitute a risk factor. I the the, love the way the doctors say it. Even though it looks like we might really have an answer, we're going to ignore it because, well, more studies would be needed. And by the time those studies are completed, you and I will be dead. From what? From those diseases that they could have treated for us. But, you know, you can't be too careful. You know, they say, when, you, when your first day of medical school happened for me, First, do no harm. That's what the dean says, right? First, do no harm. And then we proceed to harm, harm, harm. Uh, maybe we didn't get the message that first day. Astaxanthin, just as an example of an anti-inflammatory, one of the strongest antioxidants in nature. It's neuroprotective. It's anti-inflammatory, anti-apoptotic. These are health-inducing changes from this nutrition. Well, it's naturally occurring red carotenoid, okay, and it exerts preventive actions against atherosclerosis, cardiovascular disease, oxidative stress, inflammation, lipid metabolism, glucose metabolism. Did Dr. Levy talk about any of these things? Yes. All right, so let's talk about our muscular mycorrhizal fungi. That's the Phenelloformis, okay? The Phenelloformis has genetical divergence that may occur over 20 years in its population, in its limited area. In other words, you can take these species, look for them, and watch them over a period of time, and they actually evolve where they are. What's this door? This door is your front door, okay? As long as you stay inside your house, you can be safe. The moment you open that front door, you have opened yourself to illness. Why? because of all the environmental toxins, the air, the water, the food. It's hard to get good food on the, on the road, okay? And I mean on the road when you're just driving around town, not just when you're driving somewhere else. And we are constantly being exposed to all these people with their infections and sharing with us and such. Thank God we don't kiss everybody whose mouth looks like this. But if we did, and people do, you've got to wonder about that, but anyway... Um, this is certainly a source of where you're going to get sick in the future. People have these things going on inside. Oh, yeah, I got a tooth, but it stopped hurting, and I do need to go get it tended to. Yeah, I kind of think you do. But that kind of tooth can create the, the marked infection and other illness changes that we spend a fortune on in our medical care system because something this simple didn't get attended to or something this complex or that complex or as complex as these. These are starting to get to be nasty, invasive mold-related diseases, okay? Now, who gets to see these first? The dentist. Why? Because you're the first line of defense against all these infections that are going to take us down. And if you pay attention to it and make those proper referrals, get them started on the road, they can actually survive and don't have to have all of the continuing changes in the oropharyngeal cavity. Candida infections are the most prevalent opportunist fungal infections. Biofilms are antifungal resistant. In other words, it's kind of a thick, think of it like this, painting rubber cement over a surface, and then all the things want to grow in the rubber cement. Don't try to kill your biofilm. Try to replace the organisms growing in it. That's an important phenomenon because it is protective when all the good things are growing in it. So, <clears throat> resveratrol showed an anti-biofilm effect, inhibiting the formation and eradicating the mature biofilm with the bad bugs in it. Wait a minute, resveratrol, we just, we just, we just talked about with Dr. Levy, as an anti-inflammatory. So, do you see how the picture keeps coming together? Here's sources of resveratrol, they're colored, okay, why? Because it's, it's, it's bioflavonoids and those are the colors in plants. And those are phenolic compounds that are in various plant species because that is their defense against, are you ready, fungus. So they're preparing their own defense, and we can take advantage of it. Stilbenoids exert various biological activities. They are all anti-inflammatory. Resveratrol is one of the major ones, okay? 
And it's just antioxidant. It shows positive health effects against cancer and heart disease, neurodegenerative diseases, diabetes and such. Can you see how the picture keeps coming around? Here's a funny one, terminally chibula tree, used for anti-diabetic, mutagenic, oxidant, bacterial, fungal, viral effects. Dental plaque bacteria are intimately associated with gingivitis and periodontitis, and they are reduced by this particular fruit. And it also prevents bone resorption, an interesting little deal. That's what the tree looks like. That's what the fruit looks like. I've never encountered one. Oh, well. How about people with bad breathing disorders, okay? You ever seen anybody with status asthmaticus? That's where they've got a bad asthma attack and we can't stop it. That will make you believe you're going to die. Well, status asthmaticus, they try to use cortisone and bronchodilators and oxygen and chest tubes and anesthesia sometimes and antibiotics. Does it sound like we are not winning games like that? Well, guess what? Fungal exposure is a major risk factor for developing asthma. Fungal exposure, a major risk factor. And so Canada albicans remains one of the ones to readily induce asthma. And this might represent a fungal infection process, this asthma treatment. Just think of it when you're watching all the advertisements for asthma and COPD on the TV. Mucormycosis infections, these are life-threatening. They occur with all the variety of risk factors we know about. But the interesting thing is, Treatment really requires correction of the underlying risk factors. In other words, it's not just, oh, we've got to treat that. We've got to treat the risk factors that allow you to stumble into that. That's going to be deadly. That's not fun. How about this? This is turmeric, curcumin. Turns out curcumin is effective against bacteria, viruses, fungi, parasites. It apparently reduces the ergosterol in the cell wall of the fungus. And that results in the fungus getting sick and dying. Wait a minute, I'd rather the fungus die than I die. That seems like a good idea. Oral administration of curcumin is more effective than dexamethasone. Dexamethasone, that's strong cortisone in reducing the fungal burden in mice, okay? And the adhesion of Canada species is reduced. And that's in comparison to fluconazole, which is a pretty powerful antifungal medication. The synergistic activity of curcumin with the azole and polyene drugs, in other words, the ones we use as antifungal, shows a 10 to 35-fold reduction in the minimum inhibitory concentrations needed to effectively treat the fungal disease. In other words, you can use these things like curcumin to help make the drugs much more effective so you get shorter courses of treatment and better improvement. The mixture of curcumin and, are you ready, ascorbic acid a five to tenfold reduction in the minimum inhibitory concentrations needed. Curcumin in combination with different fungicide materials increases the efficacy of those antifungal strategies. You know, the most significant effect was found against Canada species, and that's the major one around the planet for the yeast syndrome. It's not for deep blood fungus, but it might be that's what predisposes people to get the deep blood fungus. Here's just an example showing on the yeast cell that the different drugs work in different levels so that you know I try to combine them to get this and that so that I can use lower dosages on these things. But increased drug resistance from fungi cannot be avoided. And those biofilms, we're back to that because that can make things tricky in terms of delivering the drug to it. Antifungal substances derived from plants can selectively act on different targets with fewer side effects. We're talking, you've heard about them, garlic and oregano, podarco, cloves, walnut, olive oil, tea tree oil, golden seal, calendula, spearmint, neem. These are things that we've talked about, but it turns out there is a very good intellectual basis for using these things. Phenolic acids, flavonoids, tannins, and such like that, these are the polyphenols. Dr. Levy was talking about the importance of these as anti-cancer, anti-hypertensive, anti-allergen, inflammatory, oxidant, and antimicrobial. <clears throat> you know, this is called food if we eat it right and if we take the right supplementation, especially if we're sick if we do those. Essential oils also have shown dramatic effects. This is one of the reasons people who've been sick and say, oh, I found this, this brand of wonderful oils and now I'm getting better, because they actually do have antifungal effects. And terpenoids in those oils may be useful as future anti 
fungal chemotherapeutic agents, not just for cancers, but for infections. And, you know, the thing is, is that the advantages of combining these therapies includes lower dosages of antifungal agents with synergistic activities, the development of less drug resistance. Remember, these plants have developed these particular ways of avoiding fungal decay. In other words, you know, being eaten by the fungus. That's what it's trying to do. And these have lasted for a lot of years. If we use them properly, we can probably reduce the drugs that we, we tend to rely on in order to get treatment. Here's a fun example. This is a plant that's a meat eater. This is carnivora, okay, the, the Venus flytrap. And indeed, the carnivora extracts that are used, uh, they actually appear to have a major antifungal effect for plant and fungal pathogens. Uh, that's interesting because that just sort of opens a whole new world of how we might take care of problems. Uh, what kind of problems? We've got to stop putting all this mercury in. We've got to properly take it out when we find it. Because when you grow candida in your gut, there's examples here, guess what? That increases the level of organic mercury from the mercury that you swallow and inhale because of those fillings in your mouth. So now we've got a way to increase our poisoning by having the candida fungus yeast growing in our gut. At the same time, we've got all of those fillings. Good reason to get them out. And don't forget our GMO system because that's certainly keeping us healthier, isn't it? And all these people who are walking through the fields, what are they spraying? Oh, stuff to make the food grow better. Why can't they just spray it? Why do they have to be in hazmat while they spray it? Because it'll be safe for you when the food finally gets to your table. I'm sure you can believe that. And these just show the concentrations of the various pesticides and things like that in the various neighbor neighborhoods. Corticosteroids, which you know we use for the confusing diseases, have lots of side effects, and any of those things can take you out. They literally can kill you. And that's why corticosteroids should not be widely used, except very carefully in combination in ways that help people. Here's examples of the injuries that chemotherapy causes. It's every organ in the body can be damaged by chemotherapy. So if you have a disease, and they say, you know, the way we treat this is, uh, you know, with chemotherapy. Okay, realize that's the first disease, and you're going to show subsequent diseases because they're going to create them. And remember, with puzzling diseases, there's only two things we use, chemotherapy and cortisone, or cortisone and chemotherapy. You pick the order. That's what happens with those puzzling diseases that I listed in the beginning, such as rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, prostate cancer, leukemia, acquired immunocompromise, autoimmune diseases, heart attacks and strokes, or resistant bacterial infections, hospital-related fungal infections. That's about 100,000 Americans a year. They're often deadly. Community-acquired fungal infections. These numbers don't include all the other illness patients that are associated with fungal disease. And yet, what we're looking at is the casual way with which that etiology, the fungus causing the problem, is simply ignored. It's simply ignored. Well, if it's ignored, remember, what you don't treat, don't get better. What don't get better is what's going to kill you. And indeed, your doctor's choosing not to treat. When I was doing hospital work back in the old days, <clears throat> I would write, because I'd gotten a master's in nutrition. I knew a little bit about this. I would write nutritional orders, and I would write antifungal orders for my patients. And my consultants in the intensive care unit would come behind me and cancel them. Okay. And so then I would go behind them and reorder them. And they would come behind me and recancel them. It's a quick way for me never to call you as a consultant again. Okay? The other quick thing was for me to realize I ain't ever going to get people better in the ICU because you can't do what you want to do. I mean, vitamin C in the ICU, I mean, that's not going to happen. Maybe we're coming around, but maybe not. Anti this or that drugs often have antifungal activity. There's a spelling error there. Rapamycin, it's a macrolide immunosuppressant used to treat coronary stents. In other words, when they put them in, they're trying to keep them from getting blocked and reduce organ transplant rejection, a long list of side effects, but it's also antifungal. Maybe that is really the key event. Maybe it's that it's antifungal. 
Remember, your immune system, first of all, is the only one you got, okay? But your immune system is the critical piece of the puzzle. Damage to your immune system is what gets you sick. Failure to repair it is what keeps you ill and lets you die. It's your immune system. Think of the three amigos. Infection, inflammation, immunity, okay? It's all the same thing. They're the band of brothers, okay? And when you have infection, you have troubles with the other two. If you have inflammation, you have trouble with the other two. Immunity, troubles with the other two. So don't start looking because these things all interrelate. Each causes the next and is caused by and worsened by the next. But in medicine, we have uh, a very A to B kind of uh, treatment plan. You have A, we treat with B. You have C, we treat that with D. But for more effective medical care, you have A, which also means if we're looking for it, if we're thinking about it, then we start looking at risk factors and what else can come up. If you have A, you also have E and G and M, or perhaps even more. So we treat with all of the factors need to resolve the problem and create normal balance. Remember, we're dealing with infection, inflammation, and immunity. They're all the same thing. Now everybody says that, you know, the two things that are always there in life are death and taxes. But I would say that there's three certainties, death and taxes and fungus. <laughs> now how many people think there are possibly three things that are certain in life? Have I sold you on that yet? Death, taxes, fungus? Yeah. See, your hand, see your show of hands. I, you got to persuade your friends. Okay, there you go. Okay. So a couple of you are still going to get sick, but that's okay. <laughs> You've got to put the pieces of the puzzle together. Okay? And until you do, and the bad news is we depend on our doctors to do it. And the bad news is if our doctors don't do it, people die. My dad died four years ago. He's 95. He was visiting in my house. He slipped, fell, ripped the skin off his arm, had to go to plastic surgery. He gets <clears throat> an aspiration pneumonia. He gets congestive failure. He gets all their fancy treatments and such. They will not put him on lenoxin, heart medication that he'd been maintained on for 14 years for his mild failure pattern, always did well. They wouldn't do it, and I'd say, if you don't do it, he's going to go back into failure. So he'd go back into failure, ambulance transfer back to the real hospital, okay, for control of his congestive failure with more intensive drugs, not, not lenoxin, okay, and he'd be on two fourth-generation antibiotics. And I go, what are the antibiotics for? Well, that's the protocol. Uh, but, but he doesn't have pneumonia. He has congestive failure. Yeah, but that's the protocol. Well, I got that, but no pneumonia, so why antibiotics? That's the protocol. It's like I'm talking to a proto-wall, okay, for their protocol. That's the way they're going to do it. Still no lenoxin. They would send him back to the skilled nursing, and that's a euphemism. And you know what a euphemism is? It's neither skilled nor nursing. Okay, good. And sure enough, they would not put him on Lennox, and then guess what would happen? He'd go back into failure. We, we played this game three times. Why the two fourth-generation antibiotics? At his age, that's the protocol. Were they making him sicker and sicker? Yes. Did they put the pieces of the puzzle together? No. Was I telling them the pieces of the puzzle that had worked for him for years happily with his internist and his family doctor coordinating with me? No. So you can tell doctors about the pieces of the puzzle, and the problem is they're looking the other way. They don't care, and the faster you get out of their field of view, the better. Ah, Got to tell you, things happen, explosive things happen when people are not treated right, okay? When the volcano explodes, it's not the time to figure out how to put the cork back in. It ain't going to happen. It's like domino diseases. You push one of the dominoes, and it just keeps going, 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 going. And that's how we die in this country. We die from progressive medical care. I would rather have regressive medical care. I think that's going to be better, and especially facing nutrition is one of the key things. Oh, maybe like vitamin C, that could be potentially helpful. Maybe resveratrol and so on. It's just like a cookie cutter system where those pretzels just keep rolling off the line. Nothing's going to stop them. They just keep coming. And that's the way the drugs are produced. And that's the way the drugs are sold. And that's the way people expect it. I went to the doctor. I got my prescription. Now I'm going to get better. They have no responsibility to get better because they have no understanding 
of the actual infections that are making them sick. And when they understand that, they become whole different patients, get better very quickly, and get a real life going on in their lives. Instead, they've got a tsunami. They've got a tsunami that's killing them. It's sometimes faster, sometimes slower, but when that wave catches you, you're done. The chances of reversing it are minimal. The chances of you going back to a placid sea and enjoying your life are pretty much over. Uh Uh-oh. I misspoke myself. (laughs) That happens. People do. I kind of led you to the idea that it was just the fungus, but it isn't. It's the polymicrobial community. It's all those little bastards together, each making you sicker for the other to take advantage of you. And then recycling that system and recycling that system. And that's the progressive illness. And the fact that we stay alive any time longer and the fact that we are actually doing well for any years, that's tribute to the resilience of the human frame. You know, we kind of are in pretty good shape. I'm surprised we stay alive at all given the infectious assault that we get. And in actual fact, and, and I'm pretty sure I've discussed this with most of you guys, What I used to see when I started practice 40 years ago was people in their 70s, 80s were sick. And then it was people in their 60s and 70s. Then it was in their 50s and 60s. Then it was in their 40s and 50s. Then it was in their 30s and 40s. And now it's not uncommon to see very sick people in their 20s. And you go, what happened? Well, part of it is in 1940 we asked the question, can we poison the planet? Guess what? The answer is yes, we can. We we figured out how to do that. That's not hard. And then what we did is we started getting away from the farms and went to agribusiness. So our nutrition dramatically changed. And then we started getting the government telling us how we ought to eat and making it easily available and such like that. So all the benefits of fresh water supplies and public hygiene have pretty much been reversed by our nutritional deficiencies and toxic exposures. Okay, so in any event, let's talk about the polymicrobial infections. Doxycycline plus terbinifidine or fluconazole or itraconazole, this can make actually a major difference in patients who are suffering. Or clarithromycin plus any of these above, or doxycycline and ivermectin. I mean, you hear what I'm saying is these are strange drugs, except for the doxy and the biaxin. So the, the key is, is that It's not complicated for a doctor who wants to learn how to take care of these infections. He may stumble, in which case he should refer to somebody who does know how to take care of them. But the deal is is that we can get a start and actually reverse a lot of the changes that people have by fairly simple things. Now, you know, the Fry Lab started being able to do this test three years ago. And at that time, we used to use five, six, seven drugs, higher dosages, longer times. You ever try to keep a patient on a uncomfortable drug for a longer time. That's hard. That doesn't happen. And then you go, well, you know, you actually look pretty good. Maybe we didn't have to prescribe it for longer. And what has happened is the treatment programs are getting smaller. They're getting lower in dosage. They're getting shorter in time. And we're still getting really good results. That's kind of neat because these are the puzzling diseases for which there isn't any obvious treatment. These are the devastating diseases where people feel badly and don't get better. They have worms. They have parasites that are nasty. Here's an example on classification of parasites. Protozoa, the amoeba and the ciliates and so on. Multicellular worms and stuff. You go, worms? Yeah. Wait a minute. Why would we have worms in this country? Anybody ever go to the bathroom and see the little sign that says employees must wash their hands? They, they didn't know that? They, they, they have to be reminded? Okay, that's different. I do hope they wash their hands. But remember that a lot of the people who are serving our needs in food establishments and other places, <clears throat> you know, a little green card that they don't have? Okay? And they're just kind of flying under the radar, and they are bringing with them all of their health initiatives from overseas, which might not be much. In other words, while we had barriers to people coming in who were really sick, 
we have no barrier now, and they can bring their sickness with them. You know, we've got a resurgence of TB. We've got a resurgence of polio, smallpox. I mean, things that we eliminated, we now have in surges coming through because our population is being exposed to that, and that includes worms, okay? This is kind of fun. This is looking at a, a sequential thing on a, on a lab test, and you're going, well, you know what? The consensus is, and you go, wait a minute, the consensus. In other words, we're going to kind of average these things together, and we're going to kind of vote and say, this looks probably like what that is. That's not quite precise enough in my worldview, unless it doesn't matter every single one of these is going to be knocked out by the drug treatment that we're going to use, or the resveratrol and curcumin and so on. Unfortunately, I don't think we're at that level yet. But I wanted to show you there is still com some confusion and fudge factor because there is a medical knowledge gap, okay? We, the clinical information explosion is happening, and we're not keeping up with it. Um, you know, the idea that we, well, when I started medical school, they said that the, the amount of information will double every four years. Okay, so when I ended medical school, it was twice as much information. When I ended residency, it's twice that, so now it's four times as much information, and that was 40 years ago. So you can imagine I have just a little smidge of understanding of what's really able to be understood. So hopefully what we're going to get is computerized systems, AI and whatever, that can actually sift through all of this and start to make sense. But what's the problem with a computerized system? The bias of the programmer. Okay? It's the bias of our medical education. The professors say, this is how you do it, and that's how people do it forever because they stop learning when they start practicing. It should be a license to learn, not a license to kill. But what comes down to it is the bias of the programming can keep us from ever seeing these kinds of issues, which is why the free exchange of information, like in meetings like this, is what can lead to continuing expansion of the knowledge of what really is effective treatment. Now remember, close counts on horseshoes, okay, hand grenades, and shotguns. So we don't really want to be close with our treatments. We want to be as precise as possible. It's hard to be as precise as possible when I did then what I knew how to do, and it's still what I do. Yeah, I know that's still what you do. You know, can, have you been to any continuing edu courses, education courses for physicians? Okay, I have. I don't like them, so I stopped going. I just go to the continuing education courses for integrative medicine physicians because they're actually learning and they're still on target with what's going on. They are advancing the field. They are making understanding of these strange illness situations possible. And treatment then can proceed. Remember, you don't know about something, you don't look for it. If you dismiss the idea, you don't look for it. If you don't think it's relevant in this patient, you don't look for it. If you do, don't test for it, you don't find it. If you don't find it, you don't treatment, treat it. If you don't treat it, the patient stays sick. If that's what the problem is. But when you're faced with the idea, I don't know what the problem is, it's RA, it's uh, systemic lupus, it's uh, MS, it's ALS, it's, it's, you know, blah, blah, blah. You just go ahead and pick it, osteoarthritis. Wait a minute, arthritis? Don't you just use an anti-inflammatory? Yes, if you want to kill someone, okay? Oh, that, I don't say that facetiously. That's how I got into integrative medicine. In my first year in practice, fellow comes in in his early 50s, and I prescribed naproxen, a relatively new drug he had not had, and he thought I walked on water because he could. He was suddenly pain-free and did great until I was called to the intensive care unit where he bled to death in front of me from an ulceration in his gut caused by naproxen that I prescribed. So this first do no harm, mm, that can weigh heavily on you at that point. And that's how I ended up into integrative medicine because I was not ever going to do that kind of crap again. Incidentally, it's still available. It's much safer now. They call it a leave. So just take two leaves, you got the same dose I gave him. So I did then what I knew how to do, but then my job is to learn to do things different. What if you're right and they're wrong? This is the problem that integrative medicine doctors, integrative dental doctors face, is you're dealing with a board that's swimming that way, and you're swimming this way, because you have figured out how to do it in a way that it works better for patients. 
It works healthier for patients. They're not willing to tolerate that very much because, well, they're right. No, what if you're right and they're wrong? We have a big uphill climb on this. But remember, knowledge is power. Knowing how to do it does make a difference because you can actually hit the bullseye. You can actually take very sick patients and make them very much better. You know, it is a big jump and there's a lot of risks in between there, okay? And the risk that we face with our patients is really quite simple. They can die. They can die from the kinds of illnesses that we fail to treat well enough. But they can also die from the kinds of illnesses they are creating called lifestyle illnesses. But you know what? They're one and the same because those lifestyle illnesses are taking them to the level of fungal illness and pushing them over the edge. And that's exactly what every single one of the lifestyle changes does, which is why it's so much prevalent in our society now. Experience is a hard teacher because she gives the test first and the lesson afterwards. So here's the take-home lesson. Injuries, infections. Now we think of infections as bacterial, viral, parasitic. We need to start thinking of them as fungal. Injuries, infections, and remember those infections are fungal. So here's what you want to do is share that information. Share that to people who say, Oh, I could see that. That would make sense. Have them start actually getting information and learning about fungal illness. It is a bright idea, okay? It's a great idea, but you've got to walk through the door. And every time you walk outside your own door, you're in hazardous territory, whether it's the intellectual door you're walking out of or the house where, you know, you have your own food and environmental control and so on. What are the things you can do if you think fungal disease is important to control? Here's one. Brush your teeth. Remember that biofilm? We have to disrupt that biofilm so that it can actually get healthier. Mechanical disruption of that biofilm makes a huge difference. How much? Huge difference. Okay. Why did Weston Price find that people who you know, were in the deepest dark Africa or wherever else and didn't brush their teeth, why did they have such great dentition? Because they chewed on roots and stems and stuff they were effectively brushing their teeth with their nutritional products, which also were loaded with polyphenols, bioflavonoids, and so on. In other words, they were keeping their biofilms healthy, which we didn't know. You know, uh, I, well, I belabor the point, but we don't do what we need to do to take care of ourselves because there's got to be a pill for it. Instead, there's actually a soap for it. I would suggest that you wash your mouth out with soap because that'll keep you honest. Remember when we were kids and that was the threat? Happily for a lot of us, they didn't actually do it very often. But tooth soap is magic. I had inflammatory periodontal disease for virtually 60 years of my life. There were areas I could not brush because it was exciting electric pain, okay? And it's just, it was continuous and it didn't matter sensodyne or whatever else. It kept happening. And one of my patients said to me as, as I was talking with him, he says, Doc, have you ever tried brushing your teeth with soap? I had the same reaction you do when I say it. Oh, not so. Mm. He got me a paper on it. I gave it to my dentist. He said, oh, I don't see any reason not to. Ivory soap is 99 and 44, 100% pure. I figured that's pretty good, okay? So I started rubbing my toothbrush on and brushing with the ivory soap. And in 30 days, my periodontal gingival changes were gone. My salsi went from six and eights down to twos and threes and an occasional four. That's pretty impressive because I can actually brush all the areas of my mouth now. I found out about tooth soap, a little bit easier than the ivory, and I have to tell you that when I have patients come in with periodontal disease, I say, do you want me to make it better? Well, I'm seeing this doctor, I'm going to get operation. I said, yeah, but before your operation, would you like for it to get better? And I get, have them get a Sonicare toothbrush, or any of the other mechanical ones like that. Get the tooth soap, and then there's other little mechanical things you can do. But those are the two critical pieces of information. Flossing would be a good idea because there's another area on the, on the tooth to take care of. And you can even do the flossing with uh, water faucets and a different approach, but mechanically can help. What about different solutions you can rinse your mouth with? Well, there's pros and cons on all of those and such. 
I think that basically we're going to find there will be a developed one that we will all agree is probably among the best. Periodine, which I understand is no longer going to be available, or at least not in its present form, it's essential oils. And I've had patients chew on those after they do their you know, soap brushing and stuff and get dramatically better on their gums and then find that they're in good shape. How about drinking them water? It's a good idea. Sure beats Coke. Well, not that I'm partial against Coke. It also beats Dr. Pepper and 7-Up and a few others, okay? How about real fresh vegetables? You'll notice the colors. Remember the colors because that's your bioflavonoids. That's your polyphenols. That's your natural protection against inflammation and infection. How about enough meats? You know, it's real frustrating. People don't eat enough meats. Well, they eat their fried chicken, but that doesn't actually really kind of qualify as the meats that we're supposed to get, and they should be taking their supplements. How many? Well, it depends on what we're treating. If we're just maintaining good health, it's not a whole bunch. If we're actually trying to reverse the disease and we want to do it before a few years have gone by, it can be many. How about probiotics? That's a good idea because your microbiome, you know, the, the, we're learning so much now about the bacteriology. We have an oral microbiome, we have a sinus microbiome, we have a lung microbiome, we have a gut microbiome. They now have shown kidney and bladder microbiome, okay? But every one of those areas has a fungibiome. In other words, different yeasts and, and uh, uh, mold and fungus and whatever growing in those zones, generally under good control when you're in good health. But that's a biome that has received virtually no attention. And I think if we're lucky, if we get the good replacement of a microbiome, that it'll take care of itself in a lot of cases. But I got to tell you, it takes months to budge a microbiome. It's not just like, okay, you know, take this bottle and you'll be just fine. That was an idea I gave up a long time ago. How about sit down supper? I don't know. I don't have time. Do you? I, you don't have time, do you? Marvin's, no, he's got a rush, so we can't have a sit down. But the thing is, is that what we've done is we've changed our lifestyle to where we just induce stress and we fail to put calming times in in family enjoyment and so on. We're so busy running helter-skelter. But really, that can make a huge difference, especially if you're doing your sit-down meals at home. George Washington, fairly wealthy guy. I mean, he had a plantation. He had lots of you know, different industries and so on. He brought out the sugar at their dinner table when they had guests. Sugar was expensive. I mean, they made it, too, there at the plantation. That was expensive. They didn't just have that willy-nilly like we do. And we can have sugar six different times a day. And that's part of our problem with the microbiome. You know, the McGuire's sugar said it best. Sugar time, sugar time, sugar time. But what we have to remember is bad, bad, bad sugar. Sugar bad, okay? Smoking, bad, okay? Toxic metals, bad. We need to use chelation to get rid of them. You can't avoid getting the toxic metals in. I can guarantee you that. They're all over the environment. You're getting them in, okay? The older you are, the more concentrated you have of the lead and such like that. But the deal is, is we can get them out. So it takes dozens of years to get them in and a few dozen treatments to really remove enough of them that they get out of the way and stop damaging your defense system and allowing the inflammation, because they're pro-oxidant, allowing the inflammation to go wild. <sighs> I hate putting this one up. <laughs> <Skip it. laughs> all right, good, I'll skip it. And avoid chemicals. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Avoid chemicals and additives. Uh, you know, if you have to read the label on, on your food, uh-oh, okay, because that, that's trouble, especially when you encounter words you can't pronounce. But don't worry, they're just emulsifiers and uh, fires and iron fires and running and stuff. And I just think of them creating fires on the inside. Avoid drugs wherever possible. You know, you go to the doctor, and, and a lot of times I'll write an antibiotic for a patient for their throat infection or their bladder or whatever, and I'll say, don't fill it. Let's try these other strategies first. If it just all gets better in the next day or two, don't worry about it. But you don't have to call me. You can go ahead and fill it if you feel like it. That's a great way to do it because if the patient gets better with conservative strategies, you don't have to do something. Get some exercise. It's a good idea. Walking is the simplest. Walking makes sense. Walking just does everything. Besides that, when you walk, you see the outside world, and that's beautiful. Get enough sleep. Get enough restful sleep. We have a hard time doing that, but I'll tell you, 
They sure do make you feel better, okay? Oxygen. I started studying oxygen levels in 1993 because of congestive heart failure. And it turns out you don't have to have CHF. You can have a whole series of other illnesses, heart disease, strokes, arthritis, cancer, whatever, and you often have lower oxygen levels at the levels that the doctors think are okay. Well, your oxygen level is down at 93. Yeah, but 99 and 100 are normal. 98 is borderline. 97 is abnormal. 88 is Medicare oxygen for life. So they'll let you get down there before you can do oxygen. And Medicare has now made it impossible. They don't want to pay for oxygen, period. And I'll let you guess why. Good guess. Oropharyngeal constriction here. You know, this is Felix Lau's um, slide, thank you. And it's also an example of how a constricted airway can be so misdiagnosed. Because what they want to do is put everybody on the scuba dive, you know, CPAP. Or if you're lucky, they actually use BiPAP, which is a whole lot safer. I mean, I think that they're dangerous for your lungs anyway. But the deal is, is that if you simply readjust the three-foot cage, as Felix says, your mouth has a six-foot tiger, your tongue, in a three-foot cage. If you simply rearrange that by proper appliances and positioning, you can open that airway and you no longer have a restrictive pattern. Now, you may still have a central pattern. That's the oxygen deficiency. So you've got to look at all the dynamics, and I can guarantee you the doctors don't. How about reducing stress? That would be a great idea. One of my friends, Pelletier, wrote a book called Don't Sweat the Small Stuff. Subtitle. It's all small stuff. And when you look at it like that, remember, they don't take you out back behind the barn and kill you. You know, it may be uncomfortable and whatever, but life goes on. Just learn to, learn to live with it. Learn to just kind of go with the flow, you know. I like that song, if you can't be with the one you love, love the one you're with. <laughs> Classes of antifungal drugs, they are available. There's about 30 different drugs we can use to treat the deep blood fungus pattern. So there's a clinical art involved. Okay, <clears throat> I think we're getting closer to understanding things, and the nice news is, is that as we really do, we're going to have shorter, simpler treatment programs. Anti-nematode, these are ones that can be used against worms and such, but if you'll notice, the azoles are in this category. Those azoles are classically antifungal. And then here's protozoan, anti-malarial, and anti helminth and stuff. And when you start going across, you start realizing, wait a minute, those all look kind of like similar drugs. Yes. So the idea is that if we've got a polymicrobial community, if we have several different organisms involved and we select them correctly, we'll probably be able to bring everything down to enough of a level. Now, you've got to remember that bringing things down, I don't think in terms of eradication. I was hopeful in the beginning. I think all we're going to do is bring the deep blood fungus down to a level where it's not interfering anymore. Okay? And that's really the key, is just get it to where it's out of the way and we can lead our lives a whole lot more healthy, a whole lot more comfortable, okay? And that's why I think we see it when we find it in, quote, normal people, is they still have it under control enough, they are developing disease, okay? And we don't yet have that quantitative test where we can really see where are they along that progression. But as we start looking at our patients for nutritional and toxic evaluations, fungal evaluations, we'll begin to lose, uh, use the correct adjustments on those antifungal drugs and really make a difference. Ozone. Yeah, I think that has a real place in this. Ozone, vitamin C, these things are working similarly. Specific nutritionals with an anti-infection and anti-inflammation property. And I got news for you, they're often the same exact thing. Why? Infection, inflammation, immunity. They're all the same thing. Specific nutraceuticals with immune-stimulating and organ support properties. Again, they're all the same thing. Mycotoxins are dangerous. Mycotoxins come from big, bad mold and fungus, okay? The saga begins all over again. Canada Auris is an emerging multi-drug-resistant yeast. Yeast, for God's sake, not just uh, mold or fungus causes serious invasive infections discovered not 10 years ago. It's resistant to multiple classes of antifungals. It's misidentified usually as other yeasts. Remember I said the clinical laboratory has a hard time figuring these out. 
and the ability to colonize patients perhaps indefinitely and persist in the healthcare environment is almost a guarantee it is going to spread throughout the population of ill people because they'll be in and out of the hospitals, in and out of our clinics, and we will all end up with this new yeast. Great, isn't that just beautiful? Okay, I'm hoping to get my picture on the cover of the Rolling Stone <laughs> because, you know what, it's just kind of like being a, uh, a lone voice out in the wilderness. This stuff is real. By enlisting all of you guys in this thinking pattern, I am able to say we are going to get there from here. Now, maybe we'll drag a lot of our friends and family and our patients with us, and maybe not. But the point is, okay, what we have to do is be different enough, be unique enough in our thinking patterns that we include fungus, yeast, mold, mildew as a serious threat to our health that we always have to treat, not sometimes, that we always have to address, not occasionally, that we always know is involved because it is. And I'll leave you with this parting comment, okay? Our logo is the, the man maneuvering unit up there in space. And the deal is, is that the space suit was developed. One of my patients said, you know your logo? And I said, yeah. She said, my husband designed that unit. Oh, okay. That's cool. That's what happens when you live in Houston. The space suit was designed to keep us safe. They took everything that they could understand in physics, biology, whatever, and developed a suit to keep us safe in the hostile environment of space. But our body, your body, each body, is the spacesuit that we wear now to keep us safe in the hostile environment of planet Earth. Because everything is trying to eat us, the bacteria, the fungus, the viruses, the worms, everything, all this stuff. And nutritional deficiencies are our responsibility. Toxic exposures are somewhat our responsibility, but doing something about it, doing something about it, is what allows us to create that safety net of our own personal spacesuit. You have been a wonderful audience. I hope I've given you some expanded perspectives. Thank you. Isn't John amazing with the knowledge that he has to share? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Feathered up. Thank you, man. I do have a...